Okay, um, all right, so Applied Kabardin Apologies. I have to admit that uh, Michaela gave me this title. It's not exactly the title I would have chosen, um, but it sort of prodded me in, in a good direction, I hope. Um, so in particular, I will not start this talk by um, immediately jumping into symmetric monoidal infinity n categories and functors and that kind of nonsense. I'll try to at least um, uh, motivate some, some uh, things for the, the physics uh, community. So today, this is just an outline for today. Uh, I want to uh, build up to extended Uh, uh, TFT um, from some physics. To be honest, this is probably maybe more useful for some of my students, for instance, who just take TFT as interesting in its own right and don't actually know the history. Um, uh, I want to uh, uh, share some anecdotes from history. And some admonishments. Found amusing, uh, and then I'll uh, give some remarks about higher categories and cobordisms. Uh, I'll uh, I'll state the cobordism hypothesis. Um, can I actually uh, just, can I see a quick show of hands who has seen a, a careful statement of the Kabordism hypothesis in the audience? Okay, so most of the math people are not the physics people, that's great. Uh, and, then, uh, and then finally, I'll uh, give an a overview of the remaining answers. Okay, so that's the plan for today. All right. Um, so actually, um, before I start building up to extended TFT, um, I, want, I want to do, so actually, uh, connecting to the last lecture, uh, there was this nice relationship that was expressed between this, uh, this uh, um, uh, Ising CFT and the Majorana uh, CFT. And uh, one of the things, uh, sorry, lattice, lattice uh, model. And one of the things that, uh, that we noticed is that uh, you know there was this. Um, it was important that the Majorana and the Ising were not uh, equal; they weren't the same theory. But there was this fairly precise mathematical uh, thing that we could do um, to get from one to the other. And I think the sort of uh, picture that we'd like to build up to in, in my lectures and in Constantine's lecture is to be able to sort of uh, start with a picture like. The Majorana theory. It has some uh, some lattice description, so it's not topological. Um, what we'd like to do is realize that it has uh, what's called the symmetry TFT, uh, and uh, so this this will just be a, a, a 2D or 3D. Uh, so always one one dimension higher than the way you're treating Majorana. Theory, and uh, and uh, the nice thing is that uh, once we've once we've made sense out of the symmetry TFT, uh, and once we've made sense how to sort of couple it, how to make it act on the Majorana TFT, uh, Majorana uh, lattice theory, then we can start doing completely formal operations that mathematicians have been doing for 20 or 30 years um, to uh, to start making new constructions. So I, I don't know this particular example as well as I would like, but I think that the idea would be that, uh, that, the, that the SEM TFT, uh, it, there's this group, there was this group Z mod, uh, Z2N here, and I think that when we try to gauge the Z2 uh, uh, symmetry, uh, we get uh, what's called the Tambara Yamagami 
uh, category uh, attached to z mod n and z mod 2. So this is something that is perfectly well defined mathematically. And then we have some, uh, some uh, defect between these. Uh, and the nice thing is that if you knew that this thing existed and you knew that you had this uh, symmetry on it, then you could just uh, completely uh, do some, some uh, abstract computations to know that this gauging defect exists, that it, it, on the other side is Tambari Yamagami. And I think uh, um, that, the, that the story is that when you, uh, when you flatten that defect, then you're supposed to get Ising. Uh, with the Tambari Yamagami. So this, uh, this non-invertible defect that was explained uh, is captured algebraically by, by something called the Tambari Yamagami category. And this is just that thing that has D, 1, and eta, and those fusion rules. Um, so that's a, sort of some, some pre-motivation connecting to the uh, preceding lecture of the kind of thing that we'd like to do. We'd like to uh, recognize symmetries, uh, abstract them, and then do uh, well understood tricks to, to move between uh, different So why does the Tamara Yamagami here depends on two finite groups? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so why two finite groups? So you notice that D, you had this D cross D, and this is uh, one, plus eta, you put over two, yeah. Okay, so there's something manifestly z2 about this, which is that if I put, it, this, this f fusion category has a z2 grading, right? If I put this in plus one degree, and this in plus one degree, and then I put this in, uh, in degree zero, then you notice that plus one times plus one is zero. So the objects uh, d1 and eta Basically, what happens is you have a little copy of VECG uh, sitting in degree zero, and then you have a, 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 this thing acts on a copy of VECT in degree one. That's just the claim that uh, you told us that eta times d equals d, one times d equals d. So one and eta together are acting on d in a, in a trivial way. So we have, uh, we have this uh, direct sum decomposition. And uh, so this is where the Z2 is. is. Is encoded in this decomposition, yeah. Where's the N? Did you write Tambara Yamagami of ZN comma Z2? Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, I see the question. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. It's, I should say Z2, sorry. sorry. Okay. Sorry, yes. The ZN, as you say, is, is different. Yeah, sorry. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So th that was just a sort of uh, uh, off-the-cuff sketch of how to, to connect the sort of thing that I want to do uh, uh, with uh, the sort of thing that was happening in the last lectures. Okay. okay. Um, so, so our motivation. I think when you have the icing CFT, the symmetry TFT is the traditional center of some model Is that right? Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. You're asking about whether we talk about 2D or 3D. Uh, uh, here. So maybe let, let me. Uh, uh, Okay, so I want to give sort of three three motivations for the the Kavorism hypothesis and and extended TQFT. Uh, so um, the, the sort of most historical one uh, was uh, uh, T. S. Siegel. Dolan. 
and Lori uh, framework, which I'll, which I'll recall in a moment. So this was a, uh, a sort of toy model for states in QFT. Um, much more recently, there, there's two much more recent um, uh, pictures that, that we'll hear about. So this sort of uh, Friedmore Telemann picture uh, is that it, rather than thinking of it as toy models for the axioms of a quantum field theory, um, it, we come to realize that these actually allow us to encode Logical symmetries and genuine uh, quantum field theories. So by genuine, I mean physically interesting ones. Um, and as we'll see, uh, a lot of the uh, interpretation, the physical interpretation, and a lot of the examples uh, when you try to um, unpack this. Uh, uh, bring to mind this sort of Costello Gulliam um, or I also mention uh, Ayala Francis uh, picture for uh, of factorization algebras. And these are a mathematical model for the, uh, for the observables in QFT. Okay. Um, so maybe let me start with uh, Tia Siegel. The Tia Siegel picture. Uh, so um, let's say we're in, uh, so um, let, let me not worry about the, the signature. So uh, if we have some d-dimensional manifold, uh, we want to assign to this some number called the partition function. And already, this is the main uh, the main issue with with this approach is that typically the, uh, the the in physical examples these numbers are not not really well defined. We have to worry about renormalization and all kinds of business. Um, but Atia and Siegel said, let's not worry about that. Um, let's uh, think about what we would assign to uh, 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 what a, a quantum field theory ought to assign to. Uh, a d minus one dimensional uh, field theory, so a d, d minus one dimensional manifold, and this, uh, just according to physics, should be a, a, a vector space of boundary conditions. And then, as we saw this already in some in some pictures, uh, we have. Uh, Time evolution uh, so this is in say in the red tune signature we have a notion of time we imagine that we've got so, uh, we've got uh, v minus one and maybe we imagine that the that uh, that the time evolution time evolution is just given by some cylinder like so um, so uh, we want to uh, extend the picture, though, to, to not just have this distinguished time direction. We want to also allow uh, Euclidean signature, so where we don't don't preference uh, one uh, one direction of time. Uh, uh, and we also want to consider more more general uh, kinds of uh, manifolds with boundary than just cylinders. And of course, we can do that also uh, perfectly physically. So, example that must be drawn, something like this. Uh, so, what we uh, so we have some in incoming 
manifold, which is the union of these two circles, we have some outgoing manifold. And uh, well, what we can compute from this is, uh, is, is some correlations where we fix uh, boundary conditions here. So in the, in the immediate vicinity of the boundary, we say what we want our, uh, our fields, how we want them to behave. We also do this on the outgoing uh, boundary. And then we define some uh, matrix coefficients. Let me get my notation right here. Uh, and these things are um, just the, just the uh, according to the, the, the path integral prescription, uh, we integrate over, over all fields path. So we sort of uh, fix how the fields behave here, here, and here. And then we integrate over all the fields uh, in the middle that have that fixed uh, uh, behavior at the boundary. And we have this uh, e to the i. S of F. So fields F uh, restricting to F in, F out. Okay, so we, we just uh, axiomatize that you should have a structure like that. So is it a vector space over complex coefficients? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, really, you're right. So in physical examples, this should be, we should be more careful. It, it should be a Hilbert space, and, uh, and uh, we should worry about completions and stuff. And um, yeah, but in particular, it's a, a complex uh, vector space. But that means if I hand you a boundary condition, it makes sense to divide it by 7? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I see. Uh, right. So good. Okay, good. So, th so th yeah, good. So, you know, that's fair. So, uh, so these, yeah. So when I say the space of states, what I really mean is that I should. Um, I don't. I don't really. You know, it's not really sensible to. You know, it's a good question. It's not really sensible to prescribe uh, a state here, and then ask about the this this integral. Um, <coughs> Uh, rather, uh, what we do is we prescribe some sort of distribution on the on the space of states here, and this is really a uh, this is really like a, an integral transform. Yeah. So so this is really uh, a, you know if you like this is sort of a, a, a an element of the dual vector space on the space of all fields. Is that okay? Yeah. The yeah. answer is yes, because the boundary condition is just a vector in a vector space at this stage. Yeah. By, me, for, by definition, I'm, yeah, exactly. By definition, uh, by a boundary condition, I mean a vector in a certain vector space. That vector space is not literally, its elements are not literally states. There, there are some distributions. Yeah. It might be just a matter of terminology. I think in yeah. some literature in physics, we might refer to a boundary state as something subject to more yeah, so, uh, okay, yeah, thank you. I think I'm perfectly fine thinking about it as just some state in the vector space. Yeah. But to think about it as a boundary condition, sometimes we might. You put the title Atiyah Siegel picture. Right, right, right. You don't go fur any further to ask okay. because it come from some categorical thing. Yeah. Which is That's not what I had in mind, but okay, yeah. 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 Thank you for the question, yeah. Okay, um, right. So we're supposed to get these uh, numbers uh, for for every uh, every pair of states, and as we just emphasized, in you know, in in, in real reality, this will be some sort of integral transform. So it's we have to be a bit careful. But again, the, the whole point of the Tia Siegel axioms is to sort of not worry about that. Pretend, for instance, everything is a finite dimensional vector space, and then the dual would be another finite dimensional vector space, and we might just make ourselves happy that way. Okay, um, right. So yeah, so just to come back to that, I wanted to make two points. So first of all, this integral uh, is not well defined mathematically because it would involve integrating over this space of fields, uh, some invariant volume form which doesn't exist. 
So it's not just that it's divergent, it's that we can't write down the integral that's, that's posed in physical terms. So this should be, uh, th this should be an integral over all fields df, uh, but uh, the fields form an infinite uh, vector space and there just is no such thing as df, strictly speaking mathematically, so that's one issue. Um, and then another issue uh, is that we, we weren't being really careful about, uh, about gauge symmetries on the fields when we wrote this down, and I'll, I'll emphasize how that comes in. Okay. Um, but, but nevertheless, so, uh, so a T.S. Teagle, actually, can I just see a quick, there's T.S. Teagle axioms, how, how, raise your hands if these are already familiar, like the just, okay, mostly, okay, great. All right, so I'll try to move on. Um, right, so a T.S. Teagle say that we can, um, that we can uh, uh, define, a, so axiomatize this, as a functor from a certain category of d, d minus one. I'm gonna put some decorations framed or oriented, which I'll come back to, to the category of vector spaces, um, or uh, maybe the category, some category of Hilbert spaces, et cetera. I won't really worry about this. I just mean that there's the answer are some linear things. Uh, and um, so, so this is called Z, uh, and the functor will be, uh, so preserve, so sending disjoint unions to tensor products. Uh, so uh, from now on, I'll say that this, this is to say it's symmetric monoidal. Uh, and, uh, and so then Z of some manifold with boundary is, uh, is a linear map from Zn in to Zn out. Uh, and uh, g given by the matrix coefficients that, that we said before. Um, and then functoriality So functoriality comes from the idea that if I what it expresses is that if I want it, so if I specify the, uh, the behavior at the boundary uh, in, in yellow, say, So I'm going to integrate over all the uh, fields that, that sort of uh, go through this, um, through this uh, uh, region. Um, but I can sort of try to, I can, I can at least try to break that integral um, along some cuff. Uh, and I can ask, well, how does it look along that cuff? And then I can try to write this integral that I had before. Uh, I can write it as the uh, the integral on uh, on the first one, so let me call that m d one and m d two. I can write it as the integral over f on m d one, the integral over f uh, m d two. But now I need to also integrate over all of the, uh, the, the um, uh, possible uh, boundary components here. So the integral over f on the, on the, um, on this midpoint. And again, if we just, uh, if we just uh, uh, exhibit wishful thinking, uh, this was given by a matrix, this is given by a matrix. And here we're just summing over all the individual entries. So this looks like matrix multiplication. Um, 
Uh, so uh, now let me uh, uh, say that these uh, cobordisms are just this. So cob, cob d, d minus one uh, uh, are just, uh, this is just a category whose objects are d minus one manifolds and whose uh, morphisms are d-manifolds. Um, uh, I'll be coming back to it a bit uh, throughout the lecture, so let me emphasize that uh, framed and oriented, by this I mean um, that uh, we can, um, so we equip uh, the, the uh, d-manifolds with trivialization of the tangent bundle so that's extra data so now our objects are not just uh, so our morphisms I'll come to the objects in a second our morphisms are not just d manifolds they're d manifolds with an extra choice of a trivialization of the tangent bundle uh, and we equip d minus 1 manifolds with uh, uh, stable, with, uh, with D, how do I say, um, well, with trivializations of not their uh, tangent bundle, but their tangent bundle plus R. So we add in one, one more uh, real direction. Uh, and the reason that we do that is that some of our constructions, like manifestly our fields or our, in, our integrals or something, will depend on this extra data. So we want to, to allow ourselves to fix it. Um, and the reason why for d minus 1 manifolds we, uh, we add this extra r direction is that we want to sort of say we want to insist on a compatibility. So a framing is just uh, at every point I have some uh, some basis, and I want to just say that the basis that we get on the boundary, you know, sort of is cont the continuous limit of the basis that we had inside, uh, and so I notice that I get a, a sort of full dimensional thing, not a, not a uh, d minus one dimensional. Okay, so that's the notion of a, of a framed uh, cobordism. This is very, a very useful device mathematically. Um, probably more common uh, for applications would be just an oriented theory. So then we would just ask that, say, for instance, the top dimensional manifolds are oriented. Uh, these ones are, uh, the boundary are also oriented, and the orientations are compatible. So it's a, it's a simpler notion. So TQ of T versus T of T in physics. I think I'll be a bit brief here because I know that Francis McGill will talk about this. Um, right, so, so when I've been talking about the physicist TQ of T, so again, I, I stress this is mostly for the, hopefully useful for the mathematics students. Uh, so, for instance, the partition functions that we're supposed to attach to a closed manifold, we're supposed to integrate over the space of fields, F, this path integral. Uh, and in good examples, S itself, so in nice examples, <coughs> is, uh, is the integral over the manifold MD of something called a Lagrangian of F. And the Lagrangian is just a map from fields F 
to top forms. Uh, and uh, so then we just uh, take this, these fields, we regard them in some differential um, geometry context, we, uh, we compute a Lagrangian, which gives us a top form, and then we integrate it over this compact manifold. Um, okay, sounds good, but the issue usually is that the problem uh, L typically contains uh, metric dependence. Uh, so uh, that is to say, in a, in a physical context, uh, this uh, manifold has a metric on it. So it's a Riemannian manifold, say, or, or sometimes a Lorentzian manifold. It has a metric on it. And you can see this quite explicitly. So for instance, if the fields that we study are some kind of connections, uh, A on some uh, principal bundle, Um, so, the, for instance, in, in, in Yang Mills or Chern Simons or mo most of the, the theories that you can attack mathematically, um, you'll have uh, you'll be looking at some space of principal bundles on the uh, manifold. You'll fix one, uh, and then you'll have some connection on it, um, and uh, your your space of fields are connections up to gauge equivalents. And what, what what you find often is that L has a kinetic term plus a sort of potential uh, term. And the kinetic term essentially always involves the metric. So the connection, in these types of examples, this will look like something like you take uh, uh, dA, let me write that as F sub A. So you take the curvature of your connection, you wedge it with the Hodge star of your connection, and then you have some other terms. And you see this, this Hodge star, it's very sensitive to the metric. So different, uh, d different choices of metric are going to affect your kinetic term. Uh, and it's going to tell you that this thing has no hope of being a topological invariant that could be treated as naively as, as we did here. Here I was sort of saying my, my manifolds topological in the sense that I didn't care about any extra structure on them. So there's been various uh, ways uh, uh, in the last few decades to uh, sort of sidestep the metric. And uh, to say as someone who worked on extended TFTs for a long time, I never, well, let me say I'm, I'm most excited about the new applications of TFTs. The, the, the ones that I'll give um, uh, are, to me, a bit less compelling, but I'll still mention them. Uh, especially because for applications within mathematics, rather than back to physics, these are very important uh, perspectives. Okay, so the first one is topological twists of uh, supersymmetric theories. Okay, um, so in, in supersymmetric theory, theories, what happens is that your fields, F, they live in, uh, in some kind of chain complex. And this chain complex does a lot of things for you. It handles um, these kinds of issues about uh, um, gauge symmetry on the on the gluing, they, they, they handle a, a lot of uh, important uh, features of the theory. And what you can do is find a differential called Q. So uh, Q is going to act on this, on this chain complex. Um, and uh, Q squared equals 0. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I said that poorly. Um, yeah, just a graded vector space. Which is okay, so uh, 
sometimes there is another differential, but I don't want to focus on it. What I want to focus on is this thing, Q. Now, it can act as a differential. And what we can do is take the cohomology uh, everywhere with respect to Q. That is, we take the, uh, the image of Q, the kernel of Q mod the image of Q. Uh, and what happens miraculously uh, if you've if you've if you've if your if your um, differential Q has a certain property called topological, then what happens is that the numbers um, so that the uh, the path integral uh, first of all uh, in some cases becomes well defined. Uh, but also um, loses the metric dependence. So that is that this kinetic term, uh, which had the star operator, it will now turn out to only depend sort of topologically on your connection rather than through the metric. Okay, so this is perhaps the most famous uh, way that um, this kind of ideas uh, entered into into mathematics, and so, uh, so, you know, applications here, and there's almost too many to name, but, um, so I would mention floor theory, and also some theory, um, uh, so uh, mirror symmetry, And uh, Kalano homology. These are all things that uh, you get by just not worrying so much about whether everything is well defined in the physical terms. Uh, it, it, imagining that this thing called a topological twist exists, uh, and then uh, and then deriving consequences. And typically, a lot of these consequences you can f prove rigorously, even though the conjectures came from physics. So maybe I should mention, even these supersymmetric QFTs, their mathematical um, formulation is not completely well. Uh, so another thing that we could do is look at finite gauge theories. Where um, instead of uh, some group G, like, you know, being GLN or something, we take G to be finite here. Um, and there we can make perfect sense of everything in the path integral because everything becomes a finite sum. Okay, so like in the, this question about what, what do I precisely mean by the space of states, the, the um, the states of the boundary would just be a, a G connection for this finite group. There's finitely many of them, and we just consider the vector space of functions on that finite set, and then we can make perfect sense of everything that we were doing before. Okay. So those two have had a lot of uh, study mathematically, and, uh, and a lot of tools were developed to study these kinds of cases. Um, let me mention finite homotopy types as a generalization of this. But that will be uh, covered in, in Constantine's lectures. This is sort of a, a more general version of these finite group gauge theories. Yeah, so, okay, so, right, good, good question. So, um, first of all, um, you know, okay, there's a few things. So, so even mathematically, we have to make a sense of what sort of, what types of manifolds we want to study. 
Um, I mentioned framed and oriented, but you can study spin manifolds or uh, other types of uh, manifolds. Um, and so what will happen typically there, uh, you know, I, I, I just sort of waved my hands and said, miraculously, the metric dependence drops out. Um, but, you know, I, you know, the precise extent to which it drops out can, can vary. Um, we usually say it's topological if, um, if sort of the residual data that's left is something that's, um, that's uh, um, topological in the sense that we can treat it with, with homotopy theory, for instance. Um, but, you know, another, so there's also something called holomorphic twists, for example. In holomorphic twists, you do the exact same setup, but then it turns out that the, um, the role of odd star is just given by some conformal structure on the manifold, for instance, that's another case. Um, so, yeah, I don't really mean to present this as, uh, like, a completely well-oiled machine. It's just a, a place of a lot of examples, yeah. Um, about, about, the, the, about vanishing of Betty numbers and things, I... I think that that I think that that's sort of a simplifying assumption that allows people to make a rigorous definition. I don't think it's expected to be a completely necessary thing. Um, uh, help from the supersymmetry point of view, from the supersymmetric fluids point of view, is necessary. I might be misremembering, but that's. Oh, uh, you may well be right. So I'm most familiar with, for instance, the Kabus and Witten uh, twist of n equals four, and then there's no certainly no such obstructions. Um, but uh, yeah, in floor theory. Uh, is this, I thought that's quite. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're right, yeah, yeah. Variants have wall crossing, so you do need a, a metric if you go down too much. Actually, I, I might come back with it, uh, in the later lectures to an example where, you, where some of this extra data appears. Um, so, um, but maybe in like lecture three or so. Okay. Um, but where, what this collaboration, the Simons collaboration, is, is focused on is, is a different si uh, situation that was already, uh, already uh, came up uh, quite a lot last week. Um, so. So we might consider what, what physicists call infrared limits um, uh, of, uh, of uh, QFTs, uh, where we where we tune down the uh, metric. So for instance, in these uh, theories with the kinetic term, we could just add a, uh, a constant here and then scale it down to zero for us. <coughs> and then what we'd only be left with is, is the, the other terms in Lagrangian. And we might just hope that we get really lucky and that those are only topological. Um, the way that we're supposed to think about this I, uh, is something like this. So here's, here's uh, some uh, metric equipped space time, so it's some bumpy, jaggedy thing. Uh, but if we zoom out, we do what's called the renormalization group flow, we zoom out far enough, then all these bumps that we saw, um, they, they're, not, uh, they're not so important. And then this just looks like a flat, uh, flat manifold. Um, and, uh, and so um, in that way, we, we can get something which um, is not automatically topological, but where we at least make sense to hope that it is that it only depends on sort of the global topology of the, of the manifold. Um, but a, a crucial uh, point, which I think will be emphasized a lot in the talks by, by Constantine, is that uh, we can, even with the physical point of view, uh, where we have some, uh, some d-dimensional uh, space-time with a metric, what we can look for is we can look for sort of up above here in the atmosphere above this crater, we can look for a topological symmetry. 
We can try to uh, uh, ask the question, what does it mean when you couple a topological symmetry that has perfectly well-defined mathematics to a quantum field theory? Um, and uh, the biggest reason that we want to do that is when you do this RG flow, what you're basically doing is you're zooming and zooming and zooming out on this, on this picture. But this thing was already scale invariant. So what you get at the end has, has uh, the same uh, uh, symmetry. Um, so, you know, a common question that physicists want to know is, suppose you have two different quantum field theories uh, and you want to know, um, you know, maybe you can distinguish them in the CERN particle accelerator at super high energies, but maybe you want to know what, what does it look like in day-to-day -day life. Um, and uh, the RG flow is a way of, of telling you, uh, is a way of telling you um, what the sort of low energy everyday limit looks like. Um, and what you find is that you could have two distinct quantum field theories at high energy, which flow to the same theory at low energy. That's an interesting physical question. Um, and then once you pose that question, you might like to ask, uh, how could I rule that out? How could I have two different theories, QFT1 and QFT2? How can I know that they don't have the same, uh, the same uh, CFT, conformal field theory limit, this low energy, let me say IR limit? And one way that you can try to rule that out is if you realize that this has some symmetry TFT1, and this has some symmetry TFT2, and if you realize that those are not compatible, that they cannot both act on the, on the uh, IR limit. So that's one thing that, that you use this kind of idea for in physics. Um, another thing that you can use it for is, uh, so often these physical theories have what are called anomalies, um, which, we, which we already came up a few times in the, the last talk and certainly a lot last week. Um, basically, when you start from the classical field theory and you try to quantize, uh, certain computations that you need to do are ill-defined. Let's, let's say that. Um, and so what you would like to do is not give up, but you'd like to understand the precise way in which the anomalies are, um, are, uh, are ill-posed. And sometimes the anomalies are topological. I'm not saying they're always topological, but sometimes even a non-QFT, a, a, a physicist QFT will have topological anomaly. And if so, well then you may as well detect it here while you're on solid grounds. Do it. This, is, this is the realm of mathematics. So if you can somehow argue what the, what the IR limit is, and then you can, um, you can detect an anomaly here. Well, that implies there's an anomaly here and maybe gives you some insight on how to guess it. OK. Um, are there any questions at this point? What time did I start, by the way? Uh, 22 to 11.40, I think. Ten more minutes. You can oh, over it over time. Okay, that's great. Um, I'd like to uh, share some historical anecdotes. Anecdotes. Okay, so this is about uh, this is about um, the culture. So this is a, a bit of a meta discussion. So I, like many people, I saw the Oppenheimer movie. I started reading the biography, and I wanted to share a really amusing uh, correspondence. So uh, Oppenheimer is a PhD student. He's uh, visiting Niels Bohr, working on his thesis, and Bohr asks him how he's doing, and Oppenheimer says, "Well, I'm in difficulties." Bohr says, "Are the difficulties mathematical or physical?" Oppenheimer says, I'm not sure. <laughs> Bohr says, well, that's bad. <laughs> I think that this uh, anomaly, so to speak, is a present in a lot of the work in this field. Um, and uh, and uh, in reflection, Oppenheimer said that he thought it put a useful glare on the extent to which he'd become embroiled in for formal questions without stepping back to see what they really had to do with the physics of the problem. 
Um, that was probably me. I mean, I was quite happy just sort of vaguely saying that, okay, TQFTs are interesting because of physics, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, um, certain folks like Michaela and Ibu Ba are sort of uh, forcing me to um, mend my ways. Um, I also want to explain, uh, I want to share another anecdote. Let me reveal it. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, by the way, uh, mathematics in 2025 is a big uh, discussion of like the, the landscape of mathematics and it has just so many great quotes, especially about the interaction between theoretical physics and mathematics. Uh, so Jim Simons of the Simons Foundation uh, meets with Frank Yang of the Yang-Baxter equation uh, in, uh, at a conference in, in New York, I believe, and uh, Yang starts to explain to him but he's developing a theory to understand how particles, quasi-particles, can, um, can interact in a topological way. Uh, he's, he's, he's passionate, he's just given a beautiful talk, he's explained this afterwards to Simons, and Simons says, stop. Don't do that. Okay? Yang is taken aback, he's like, well, why not? And Simons says, because mathematicians already did it about 30 years ago. Uh, and Yang says, well, but why would they ever do that? Who cares about this question if there's no physics involved? And of course, they just were excited by the beauty of it, right? And I think that that's also true for many people in higher categories. Uh, people like the fact that, that you replace equations with equations between equations and all this kind of stuff. It is beautiful. Um, but because of that, a lot of smart people have done a lot, and we should learn what they did. Of course, the, their discussion, interestingly, was before Witten's revolution where, where physics flooded into mathematics, right? So higher categories now, you can't really divorce them from, uh, uh, from their physical origins, and, in, and I, I believe that you shouldn't. Um, so um, I'm, I'm trying to be as uh, opinionated to the mathematics students as I am to the physics students. I think that mathematics students who are like quite happy making arguments about infinity co-limits of complete Siegel spaces or something, and who have never sort of dealt with the path integral, I think that's a mistake. I think that we should all learn um, where some of these things come from. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, if a guiding question in this whole field is how to um, rigorously define quantum field theory, I think it's very possible uh, that uh, we may need to reinvent the wheel, maybe path integral is, is not the right thing, maybe we need to do something different. Um, but, uh, but in any case, before we reinvent the wheel, we should first understand the ones that have been built and for both communities. So I think that's why I enjoy this, this collaboration. Uh, okay, so that's enough of that. You know what, I think now is as good a time as any to, to take a break rather than starting a new section. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. say I would say what I'll do in the remaining lectures. Um, I'll do that at the start of the second lecture. If not, let's thank David again. Let me just, just jump right into it. So it extended uh, TFT. So uh, what we want to do now, uh, I'll, I'll be a bit more uh, mathematical um, in today's lecture. Um, so so last time we thought about, uh, for instance, a two-dimensional TFT as some kind of functor out of uh, out of a category of cobordisms. 
And uh, that's, that's um, if we want to compute, for instance, the partition function of some surface, then we would have a nice algorithm. We would just cut it into these basic building blocks. We would need to compute some linear maps. We would compose them, and that would give us our number. Let's draw that for reference later. Okay, so we would just need to compute z of this, z of this, z of this, z of this as a, new, as a linear operator and then compose them and uh, note that uh, z of the empty set is c so that this thing would give us a map from c to c, which is to say just a number. Um, so the, um, the key idea of extended TQFT is that we're happy with this one. We're happy with this one, but uh, these ones are still too complicated. Um, and it's not something that we can, we can address by just um, cutting them uh, more along a co-dimension one things. Um, but what we can do is, for instance, this one we could, we could cut into these pieces. So now we'll see how I'm drawing. So that's the sort of top bit. Then in the middle, we have a saddle. And on the end, we have another bit. And uh, if, you, if you sort of take this, if you take these three pieces, and you glue them together now in the vertical direction as opposed to the horizontal direction, uh, then what you get will have one boundary component that's here and two boundary components that's here. And uh, now the nice thing is that each of these pieces, this one, this one, and this one, those are all disks. Yeah? The saddle has some, some geometry to it, the way I've drawn it, but topologically it's just a disk. And so, uh, so we can hope that uh, we can recover all of the data here from just knowing z of a disk. We recover the whole TFT. Of this. Um, but we have to we have to say what we mean by that. I mean here there's clearly there, this disk is not quite the same as this disk. This is like a, a, a cup. This one is um, is is a half cylinder. This is a saddle and so on. Um, and so each of these different shapes is actually picking out different um, algebra that we might do with uh, with this data of a disk. Um, and so we need to build some more algebra. Plausible. Uh, certainly, we don't. Need, we need to know more than just the value on the disk. Okay, so there's an important construction. We're going to encode this this kind of problem. Um, so there exists. And so for people who know enough to ask the question, I mean uh, what's called an infinity n category. Um, but I'm actually going to try to manage to avoid uh, really um, getting into the full details of what I mean by infinity n category. I'll just give you a little bit of an of a idea as we go. Um, but I really want to focus on the concrete things. So an n category, so what it means so like a category, you have some objects. And the objects are going to be uh, n-framed. Oh, sorry, there exists an n. So name the category. So, um, n framed 
or oriented. I'll just state the framed case, um, but uh, there's a variant for oriented. Okay, so objects. These are uh, n framed points. Uh, one morphisms. These are n framed uh, uh, one manifolds. Uh, so, typ typically to make sense with boundary. Uh, two morphisms. These are going to be n framed uh, two manifolds <coughs> with boundary and corner. So, I'll say what I mean by that. And then we're going to keep going. Um, in a sort of predictable way, and then there's only one subtlety, which is when we talk about n-morphisms, uh, so these will be framed n-manifolds, but not, framed, not the set of framed n-manifolds form the n-morphisms, but the space of Space of framed n manifolds. I'll give some picture what, to, what what I mean by the space of framed n manifolds. Okay, and when I say that it's a space, then it means I don't have to tell you what the higher morphisms are. The higher morphisms are going to be coming from this word space. And so the fact that I started talking about spaces at the top level is roughly what this infinity means. Okay, so let me try to unpack that. Uh, Actually, again, quick show of hands if you've seen this definition before and the pictures I'm about to draw. Okay, quite a bit fewer. Okay, great. All right. So, um, all right. The, the biggest point of confusion between mathematicians and physicists about this is this, this use of the word points. The idea, because points make you think of local operators in, in physics, uh, you know, th like operators that you can insert at a point, and that's not exactly how this is intended to be meant. Um, so, first of all, by an end framing, so an end framing means, okay, so here's a point, um, and a three framing of that would be a trivialization, uh, not of its own tangent bundle, which would be a, a, a vacuous concept, but of the, uh, of the stabilized tangent bundle, which means this guy's tangent bundle is just the zero vector space, but then I add three R components. And so this is a framed point. Okay, so everywhere that I say point, if you've got a framed point, what you should really think of is it's the germ of an n-manifold. So just as I can draw that picture, I may as well have drawn a little tiny cube. Okay, so the, the points are, uh, are, are like that. Likewise, uh, in a moment, I'll come to examples like uh, a one manifold. If I would frame the, uh, if I would give it a three framing of a one manifold, what it means is a a framing not of this thing. So a framing of this as a one manifold would just be a non non vanishing vector pointing along the tangent direction. Um, but an end framing means that I, uh, that I extend like this. And again, what that means is we could think of it as like a thick bar, thick cubic shaped bar. Um, and, and those are going to be our basic building blocks. And, uh, and so the reason that we're doing that and that we need to keep track of the framing is when we want to start gluing these things along uh, larger and larger co-dimensions, we really want to think of them, uh, we, we need to think of this not just as a, uh, as a, as a one-manifold, we need to remember that, it's, that it sits near to a two-manifold and that it has some extra dimensionality there. Okay, so our, um, so with that, with that caveat though, I'm going to still try to, as much as possible, draw pictures 
without drawing the framing and just ask you to imagine that there's some, that there's some uh, uh, frame moving along. So, so our objects are framed points that I'm, for, I'm gonna follow the usual uh, abuse and just not, not mention the, the framing. Um, morphisms, so here's some example morphisms. So this is, a, this is a morphism that starts from the union of two points and ends at the empty set. So this is a morphism from, which is a hom, from the disjoint union of two points to the empty set. And it's the morphism that's given in that way. Okay. So far, so good. This is, you can imagine that like, there's a vector space here, a dual vector space here, and that's the pairing. That's the kind of thing you might mean. Where the plot starts to thicken is uh, when we talk about two morphisms. Okay, so now I have to consult my notes to be sufficiently careful. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, how do you distinguish between uh, the end point and the, the starting point. Yeah. Why yeah, don't you point? Yeah, good, good point, yes, thank you. So I, I, I said that this has a framing, um, uh, and then I said I wasn't gonna draw it anymore. Perhaps I should be a bit more careful and I should at least draw an orientation on the point. So the, the point has two orientations, plus and minus. And so then indeed, for instance here, I could say that this is a plus point and this is a minus point. And then this, uh, <coughs> This guy would be, for instance, the uh, framed one manifold such that you point out of the plus and into the minus, if that makes sense. But that's, why, that's precisely why you keep, uh, that's why in the proper definition, the formal definition, you keep these framings. Because then this would be a frame point. So you see this has a framing, a three-dimensional framing on it. This also has a three-dimensional framing, no dimension jumps. And then you, you, when you say that this is a hum, you have to give the framing and tell how it limits to the other framing. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks for that question. Okay, so the saddle, let's draw a picture of the saddle. I just have to get this right. Watch me. Okay, so here's Let's call that the plus point and the minus point. So this is a one morphism from uh, plus minus. Uh, it it uh, contracts to the empty set and then it is mapped from the empty set back. So that's a one morphism that I'm allowed to draw. Here's another one morphism that I'm allowed to draw. So if you think about it for a minute, that's the identity in this cobordism category. Just the straight shot, just moving uh, from plus to plus and from minus to minus. With no funny business, that's the identity. And um, notice that, uh, so this is in Hom. And this is in HOM. Okay, so these are, in this, these are two morphisms in the same HOM space. And um, if you, uh, I'm going to hope that, that many of you have seen at least the notion of a two category. And you know that if I have two HOMs that have the same source and target, then it makes sense to ask for a morphism. Uh, so I can ask for a morphism, uh, say, from this one to this one. Uh, and the kind of thing that's allowed, for instance, is the saddle. So the saddle is a manifold with corners. Okay, uh, uh, so it looks like that, but now I need to uh, tell you how to fill it in, and uh, well, you fill it in like a saddle. Okay, it's not the most 
lovely drawing I've ever done of a saddle, but I think you see that you see the idea. Yeah. Okay, um, so that's an example of a two morphism in the in the category. Um, and uh, now a, th a three morphism. Uh, well, well, we'll do some examples of three morphisms in a little bit. But a three morphism uh, would be would be something like this. Now you have maybe that saddle, uh, and uh, and another uh, another um, such diagram uh, where. Uh, the key thing is that you notice that the boundary of this, this, this two manifold, its boundary is um, is first of all completely fixed, and um, and the, the 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 target of the of the corners is fixed as well. So this is what's called a manifold with corners. It not only has a boundary, it has these corners, and you need to fix that. Okay, so that's an example of a two manifold. Um, okay, so I so I want to make a, a, a point now, and it's a, a point that I see a lot in um, uh, f physics papers that involve higher categories and defects. Um, so I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to to advertise a different point of view. Um, so right here, I've just told you what the objects one morphisms, two morphisms, and so on are. And if you're used to this idea of defects in physics, topological defects, topological defects are supposed to be just like this. You're supposed to have some, uh, in the physics picture, you have some uh, d-dimensional space-time, and you want to be able to embed some uh, manifold in there um, of some, some co-dimension. And uh, as, as, uh, as was explained in Shah's lectures, we can um, twist the, the Hilbert space by this manifold. And uh, the kind of thing that we want to do is to be able to cut uh, these things up. Or what you often see is like, I want to have a defect in, this, uh, in, in some dimension. And then I want to bring another defect of the same dimension. And I want to sort of smash them together and get a new defect. <coughs> This is sort of uh, defect uh, in QFT, uh, whereas here I'm talking about uh, just the structure of a of a, of a category. Um, and th there's a point I want to make, which is, of course, I have to tell you how to compose. It's not enough to, t to give you a category. It's not enough to say what are the one morphisms, what are the two morphisms, and so on. I have to tell you how to compose. And okay, roughly we kind of know what to do. I mean, roughly if I started with these three, or these four diagrams, and I told you I wanted you to compose them, I, th I think you would know what I mean, but I want to make a, a caveat. Um, so, so this was explained really nicely in uh, David Ayala's talk. So, okay, one categories, we know what those are. So you have some um, algebraic operations, namely composition and identity. So you can compose morphisms <coughs> in a row, and you have an identity morphism, and you have uh, axioms, such as uh, associativity. Okay, two categories. E.g., tensor categories, if you want something more concrete. So just on this board, I was starting to sketch you a two-category of these two-dimensional cobordisms. So you have, again, uh, algebraic operations, composition. Um, you have associativity. isomorphisms. So now because you're in a two category, it's no longer OK to ask that if you compose a bunch of one morphisms that, that their composition is associative in the sense of equality. 
You instead ask for an isomorphism. Um, and then you have to ask for coherence uh, axioms. And I want to stress that a given set of algebraic operations can have a, a different set of isomorphisms that can be made to be coherent. That's a, that's a well understood problem. Um, so th this really is an additional structure that you have to provide. Um, and then the axioms tell you that once you provided that structure, you can sort of, kind of forget about it and do, do uh, computations naively. Um, okay, so you might get the idea. Um, you might expect that we, in physicists, physics papers, often do, assume um, that you can keep going like this. Uh, that is now a three category. It should have some algebraic operations. There should be some associativity isomorphisms. Those should have some coherences, which are not axioms now, but some further isomorphisms that you satisfy. And then those need to satisfy some um, uh, axioms of, of coherence. And then you might imagine that you just keep going and going in this way, and that for any dimension you want to get to, you, you can eventually. Um, um, so one, we can't. Uh, two, we shouldn't. And three, physicists don't. Even if they pretend that they do, they don't. So I'll try to explain what I mean by that. Um, so, in, in fact, what I mean is already apparent here. So in the, in the physics literature, you would say that you have some invertible defect, let's say, to make life easy. Call it G. You have another invertible defect, H. And what is it you say? You say that you, you kind of clap your hands and uh, bring G and H together. And now they become so close together that they become a new thing that you call GH. Um, but the point is that there was a lot of choices there. I mean, if you're really strictly thinking about that, there's the question of, what path did you take? Did you first bulge out here? Or did you first bulge out here? What speed did you go? And so on. Uh, there's also the issue that sometimes we don't, even physicists don't want to write this. Sometimes they would instead write this picture. So sort of have a, have a singularity here, have GH here, G here, H here, and some isomorphism psi here. Uh, and then sometimes we want to focus on that and, and understand it. Um, and, uh, and so, um, in fact, while this is a convenient shorthand, and certainly mathematicians use it, it's not what you actually want to do. Um, in fact, um, if you're thinking about doing algebra, for instance, uh, any kind of field theory, um, also our targets. A field theory don't work that way either. Okay, just to drive this point home, so suppose that V is a finite dimensional vector space. So V and W are finite dimensional vector spaces. Okay, one of the most important things that we could possibly think about is the tensor product of V tensor W. But there isn't the tensor product of V tensor W. There's, there's, there's not such a thing because uh, V tensor W is any space X with a certain property. It's uh, any space X such that if you want to map out of it, you can give a map from V and a map from W satisfying some relations. And any space X that satisfies that property is isomorphic to any other space that satisfies that property. So we don't have a, uh, a unique notion of a vector space. Uh, we, we only have an isomorphism classes. Now, of course, when you teach undergraduates that, you then say, well, don't, don't panic. 
I'll construct you a, a canonical good example of such a vector space, but it's still not, it's still not God given. There, any other vector space is just as good. Any other uh, space X is just as good as any other. If you think about it, it more computations you do, for instance, relative tensor products over rings, this is even more important to make this point. Okay, so um, happily there's a mathematical um, side route around this issue, um, which I just, I'm not going to like give a whole lecture about this. It would deserve two or three lectures, but to a different crowd. Um, I'll just say the following thing. So, so the buzzword, so the construction, is what's called iterated complete single spaces. So this is just one of many possible models for what is meant by an infinity n category. Um, but the idea is that Homs Well, it's sort of already baked into what we're doing that if I have two objects or even two higher morphisms, that the Homs define a space. There's a whole space of Homs. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not just a set. Uh, and, um, and importantly, if I have F and G, if I have F and G uh, two, two Homs, um, uh, sorry, sorry, that doesn't make sense. I have F uh, here and G here, so two composable Homs. Then G compose F is not one other Hom, it's a whole space. Hums, which is contractible. So I hear I've been talking a few times about upgrading sets to spaces, um, and, and especially in the context of algebra, I think that needs some explanation. So what I mean by saying that, for instance, Hums form a uh, Hums form a space is that suppose I have two Homs suppose I have two morphisms if I'm in a higher category um, I can still make sense of what it means for F and F prime to be isomorphic um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of the individual Homs in the way we are used to thinking of it as points so here's F and here's F prime and then every isomorphism that I can come up with between an F and F prime, I, I can indicate with a path. So I'm just going to formally say that there's a path here. Um, this is an isomorphism uh, psi, and I might have another one uh, rho. And so there's a path psi, and there might be a different path in this space called rho. Okay, but now I could uh, I could ask. Okay, psi and rho they have the same uh, they have the same endpoints, um, so I could ask for a uh, isomorphism between those. And I'll call it eta and c. Uh, and so then I've already made I've already started building this space by adding in points and one cells, and now I can start building in uh, uh, two cells. And there was this comment about how you shouldn't worry about arrows, that in, or you'll get confused. So the nice thing here is we don't have to worry about arrows. Everything is an isomorphism. So if I have an isomorphism one way, I just have its inverse the other way when I'm talking about this, these spaces. So in this way, so higher categories, contain spaces. Um, when you restrict to isomorphism. Okay. 
Um, I hope this doesn't sound hopelessly abstract. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm asserting that there's a space. That means that in examples, we can compute it to pi 1. We can compute it to pi 2. We can try to understand it geometrically. And we, we really will do that in some examples. Okay. All right, but what's new here is that we're also going to talk about uh, composition, not as a map between these spaces. So when I've said that there's a space of Homs here and a space of Homs here, you might have expected me to just say, well, there's a a map from this space cross this space to, so you might have expected me to say that there's a map. Uh, of spaces, and there is a model for what are called infinity one categories, so Bergman. So infinity one categories. You can basically just do this. You can actually imagine that there's a well-defined map. Um, but we're going to do something even different. Um, we're just going to um, have a, a space called the composition space. Um, and the composition space is going to map uh, down to this, this product. So it, it's just to say, if I have two morphisms that are composable, then I can, um, I can just record where the first one lives, and I can record where the second one lives. And there's going to be another map down to HOM XC. Um, and all I'm going to ask is that this is, uh, this is uh, contractible, in a relative, contractible in a relative sense. Which is just, again, to say that um, if we return to this example, you know, I was making this big fuss that there's not one such well-defined thing as a tensor product. Um, but if you have your favorite construction uh, and somebody else has their favorite construction, and somebody else has their favorite construction, I'm going to first of all ask, to say it's contractible is first of all to say it's connected. So I'm going to ask that there's uh, isomorphisms connecting any two models. But I'm also going to ask that there's uh, uh, there's two morphisms connecting uh, any, um, making any possible diagram commute. Now here, in, in, in this case of vector spaces, a two morphism can only be inequality because we're, we're just working in an ordinary one category. So the, the fact that you know that any of these things are canonically isomorphic, that's, uh, that's just the fact that this has to be inequality. So, uh, yeah, um, let, let me give an example. I think it'll make it clearer than trying to, to, to spell it out precisely. Um, uh, but, uh, but first, let me say that the upshot is you can forget about it. That is, we don't have to do this thing that, that I often see in physics papers where they're sort of defining something and by making some choices and then worrying about whether some co-cycle is, is, is satisfied. You can just say that, for instance, the composition of two defects is this thing or this thing or this thing. It's just the whole space of them. And you just put it away and you don't worry about it. Uh, so I think that that's more physically meaningful than, than, than trying to worry about it when we think about physics, and we can't actually crush defects on top of one another. Sorry, I'm confused by that point. So why, why not? <laughs> why not what? Yeah, why not, uh, if I view them as operators, why can't I just consider successive action of the operator on my Hilbert space? Well, that's what it amounts to, but, um, but you know, when we say, but, but the fact that that's well defined, uh, uh, independent of topological maneuvers, um, 
uh, you know, in order to encode that well-definedness um, the way that I often see, for instance, in the lovely talk by Matt Bullimore, um, you need to uh, sort of go in piece by piece and define these things and show that it doesn't depend on your topology. And I'm just saying that there's, a, there's another framework where you just declare that this thing only depends on its topological support and the composition only depends on the topological support up to isotopy and you just don't worry about what the composition is. So, you, so the composition is, is just as much this as it is this as it is, as it is this. Do you mean that we shouldn't think about group multiplication in quantum field theory? Well, you should observe. I mean, you can observe that that uh, that it that the that no matter how you bring these things together, that this composition behaves as if it were GH. Sure, um, but you know, part of the point of of Bolmer's talk, which I think was a beautiful observation, is that so even if you have a zero form symmetry, so it seems like there's nothing higher dimensional going on. It's a zero form symmetry. When you look at it, how it acts on higher co-dimension operators. Uh, the, you start to lose touch with the strictness of associativity. <coughs> so a, a zero form, if you have a zero form symmetry, it will act strictly on the Hilbert spaces, but it can act up to a co-cycle on the co-dimension one operators, the co-dimension two operators, and so on. So, um, so uh, yeah, so I think I'm just suggesting it's not a good idea to define things by saying, oh, it's this, but up to this, and let's not worry about this. I'm saying there's a definition that is, is clean, and then you can do whatever computations you wish afterwards. So for instance, in this way, there's no need to show that some co-cycle vanishes to know that the action is well-defined. This, this is a way to define the action directly. Yeah. Sometimes the co-cycle carries some information. So sometimes uh, we encode into if, if the action is projective or not, for mm -hmm. instance, that uh, is the signal of a tooth anomaly between the one form symmetry and the zero form symmetry. And that, uh, that is an information that we don't want to lose. Right. And I, you know, I'm not proposing that you lose it, but what I'm saying is, so right, so let's look at this example. So like when we're composing G H to, to G H here. Um, you know, I was complaining about these pictures where someone adds an isomorphism psi here. Um, but uh, more precisely, that's fine. So, that, so even the definition that I gave, you can say that the composition is defined to be any of these things, but you can try to nevertheless bring the things together very closely. And you can try to relate this to something which looks singular yeah. with some psi here. And you'll get data. You will. But now, if, if, you, if you get the data, then you've got to go and prove that this is actually like a two co-cycle valued in the group. And you, you need to prove that this satisfies various axioms um, uh, by doing various moves with the F symbols and the R symbols. And you have to do some moves to prove that some co-cycle condition is satisfied. And I'm just saying that all those moves are a tautology because you're just representing the same thing in, a, in numerous different ways. Um, so um, it, it's, just a, it's just a point that I think that, the, that you don't need to work with these combinatorial axioms. There's a, there's a, a, a nicer set of axioms. Um, we already see this when we talk about cobordisms. And in fact, this was crucial to Clock and Schoenbauer's construction of the cobordism category. Because for instance, when I uh, compose these two things, we all know what we mean by that. We just mean that thing, right? But if you think about it, that's not really quite clear. Uh, because um, we needed to, um, what, we, what we can rather do is the opposite. What we can rather do is well-defined we can take a wholly composed torus and we can ask to cut it into pieces, right? And so the way of possibly, the, all the ways of possibly cutting this thing into pieces, both of which look like that, and which, which glue together to the whole, that would be the space of comp possible compositions, right? And this space is obviously contractible because 
the only choice that I've made is in between these two um, in between these two singular uh, points of the of the Morse uh, function. I'll, I'll come back to that. I just needed to choose two circles. And any two circles that I choose along here would be the same, and you can just kind of see that you can deform any of these two circles. To one another. So the, the composition of these two things is the data of this torus together with uh, any two circles that, that witness it as glued together. Yeah? Okay, so now I can come to the definition. So a fully extended uh, again I'll say uh, framed or oriented n dimensional PFT uh, is a symmetric monoidal functor. From uh, cog n, sorry, cog n framed oriented with its uh, structure of just disjoint union mapping to some algebraic uh, Uh, in category. Um, if, you, if you'd like some examples, don't worry, that's what the whole point of the lecture series is, to do lots of examples. Um, but I'll just say briefly some things you might keep in mind. So S could be uh, vector spaces, of course, we've already seen that. With the tensor product, we might think about linear categories with the Cartesian product or the, or the tensor product. Um, we can talk about spaces. Um, no, let's not get exotic. So e even just those two are fine. Uh, we can talk about tensor categories uh, with what's called the Deline tensor product. We can talk about braided tensor categories. So the, I'm, just, I'm just trying to give you the idea that there's a sort of nice class of sort of algebraic gadgets where you want to do the computations in that we'll be discussing in, throughout the series. And what we want, what we're looking for in a fully extended TFT is a way to map um, manifolds into algebraic structure. That's the, that's the mathematician's no, notion of a fully extended TFT. Okay, cartoon time, uh, I'd like to break for a cartoon. Um, so those of you who were at David Ayala's lectures last week um, will be familiar with a really lovely um, cartoon that he shared. Most of my career has been following in his footsteps, so I thought, why not, uh, why not uh, continue the tradition? Can you see? Yeah, okay. All right. So David is walking us through what he called the, uh, the, the way. So this is you, an undergraduate, and uh, you're learning uh, a, bit of, uh, a bit of set theory, you're learning some linear algebra, you get to one dimensions. So you un one categorical dimension. It means you understand things like vector spaces, algebras, rings, and so on. Uh, and in terms of TFT, what you've learned how to compute is something called uh, the dimension of a vector space. Okay, have to work harder. So then uh, around your third year, uh, fourth year of undergraduate, you start to build from here up to the world of categories. And, uh, and so uh, the, the, the homotopy way is this sort of picture that I was, was, uh, was explaining. Um, and uh, the wind of your sails is, is that you can use, uh, use ideas from category theory. But if you're really stubborn, you can just keep walking grounded completely to the, to the earth and you're just going to have to uh, hold your breath at times. Uh, if you do that, you get to the digraph witten uh, uh, character TFT. So this is, uh, this is a two-dimensional TFT that tells you about representations of a finite group. Uh, and that's totally suitable for a, uh, you know, a, um, 
dissertation project for an undergraduate to, to understand that. Okay, but then you hit really deep waters. So if you want to start to understand three manifold invariants, if you want to start to understand three manifold invariants, uh, such as the the Wittenrush Tegan Triab invariants, not invariants, and so on. Um, well, uh, you can uh, again hitch this ride on the on the homotopy theory boat, and I'll be giving you some tools in the coming lectures called monadic reconstruction. But you can also uh, get on your scuba suit and uh, continue going concretely. And you need to learn about Kirby moves, and you need to learn about semi simplicity. So you're gonna you're gonna do things concretely, but you're gonna have to work harder for it. Okay, but in either case, you'll be rewarded. Once you uh, get to dimension three, then you'll be able to construct uh, the Turaya Vero TFTs. So we'll, just, we'll construct those this week. And while you're there, you start to wonder about this thing up in the clouds called the Wittenrush Tegan Turaya invariant. And you think, this is three dimensional, and I've done all this work. Surely I should be able to do that. And something goes wrong, and you realize you can't do it. You just need to. Um, you need to maybe come back to it at another time. Okay, so now you want to move on to dimension four. You want to understand all these papers of Kevin Walker and Fried Telemann. Um, you want to understand four manifold invariants, cyborg wind theory, all this cool stuff. Um, and uh, I'm going to be uh, helping you uh, catch a ride on this boat uh, constructed by Ella and Francis called Alpha Factorization Homology, um, which is going to um, let you tootle along here. And, uh, and if you're really stubborn, you, you, you can keep going concretely. Okay, and if you can make it all the way up to four dimensions, then we get to the crane yetter theory. Uh, this is a very nice uh, invertible theory of uh, four manifolds. Uh, and we can even start to just barely glimpse some physically, um, uh, you know, some, some genuine physics gauge theories. So for instance, the kapustin witten twist of n equals four super yang mills, we can sort of understand from this uh, vantage point. Um, it's always good before you, um, you know, just keep pressing on that you take a moment to reflect on, uh, on, on where you've been. And when you do that, you notice Suddenly now have the power to blow away this cloud that was confusing you about the WRT invariants. And uh, you have the, the power of the freed uh, Telemann anomaly. I, I have to apologize. Um, uh, Telemann told me yesterday this should be that this was an idea of Walker and that Fried and Telemann <coughs> formulated it. So it should be called the I should I should have Kevin Walker's name here. Okay, and that lets you blow this cloud away. And now you have WRT theory on, found, on strong uh, uh, footing. So you understand it in the framework of all this cobordism hypothesis and all this cool stuff. You realize that while you're at it, you can get rid of this semi-simplicity that you had to use to, to track along the, the bottom of the ocean. And uh, you realize that you can construct new invariants of three manifolds that you couldn't before. Um, now, people have constructed those um, um, in, in a concrete way, but, um, but you can do it now in this way. Uh, you can get more exotic things like the, the, the quantum A polynomial, which is controlling uh, how the, the difference operator is satisfied by the Jones polynomial. You can really start to sort of uh, learn a lot about three manifolds. Okay. But you need to keep going. And uh, you look around and you see other clouds that you'd like to understand, and we don't understand them yet. Rosensky Witten. Um, up here, this is uh, David's contribution. Here's the physicist. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you keep pressing on, you realize that you've probably been working a little too hard. Because here at the end, you see Ayala and Francis just gliding through. And they've just this whole crap about the Kaboran hypothesis. And they've just defined something called beta factorization homology which just sort of makes the whole thing melt. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, 
uh, having a look at uh, David Ayala's talk uh, last week. Um, yeah. So that was the outline of what we'll do in these lectures. Um, we'll just sort of um, state the, uh, the tools, um, so the, which is this thing called the Cavortism hypothesis. And then we're just going to use it to climb these mountains one by one and construct mathematically these theories. Okay, any questions? Can you select the, the, the previous blackboard? <laughs> so when did we start again? It was at like half past what we made the five minutes left. There's five minutes left. No, there are ten or so. Ten minutes left. Okay. And then you can go over to No, that's okay, I can uh bring with us coffee and cake. Okay, now we can do it. We let's finish in ten minutes for sure. Okay, so right, we have this nice definition of a of a um, fully extended um, n-dimensional topological field theory, and I tried to convince you that it was really worthwhile to go all the way down to a point. Um, and the basic topological observation was that every manifold, by definition, is built out of little uh, little cubes. If you can glue glue the cubes. Uh, in a clever enough way, you can, you can write any n-manifold as a union of cubes. And the, uh, our goal was to understand an algebraic framework that would allow us to reconstruct this entire functor just from the data of the cube. And uh, the point is that all this higher structure in S, the fact that it's an n category and it has a symmetric monoidal structure, that's going to be the juice that we need to sort of build things together algebraically, loop things together algebraically. Okay, so let me state the Cobordism hypothesis. Okay, so uh, originally due to Baez and Dolan, and then uh, Lurie, um, and then various other people. Um, it was called a, usually in mathematics, we would call something like this a conjecture. But it was called a hypothesis because it, a hypothesis is a conjecture about things that are not yet well defined mathematically. So this was posed before the gadgets on the two sides of the conjecture were even invented yet. And it was meant to inspire us to build them. Um, so there was an equivalence. In parentheses of n minus 1 categories between, okay, uh, well, n dimensional TFTs extended TFTs, those are the things that we want to construct and study. These are equivalent, well, these are, as we just said, these are the same thing as functors from this Cobb n category. Uh, to S, symmetric monoidal functors, and uh, this is the first version, so this is the framed version. So, so far I haven't been worrying about frame, frame versus oriented, but here it matters a lot. So this is the framed version. So this is a definition uh, that an n-dimensional TFT is a functor like this, and this is equivalent to, um, we look at S, and we look at a subcategory called the fully dualizable subcategory. And what the equivalence does is it takes, uh, given a functor z in here, this functor just maps to z of the little frames z of the point, z of the framed point.
So as I said, this is this this is it's realizing the dream that we can reconstruct everything once we know what the value of the point is. And this isn't supposed to be surprising or deep, it's supposed to just be the fact that um, we constructed this thing to be topological and the, and every manifold is built from these things. So if we've got the if we've got the definitions right, this that we should be able to prove this. Um, that, that said, it's it's um, it's um, even its status as a theorem is is um, a point of discussion that I'd, I'd rather. Enjoy. Um, there's an algebraic interpretation that I quite like. Um, the algebraic interpretation is that Cobb n framed is the symmetric monoidal n category with duals uh, freely generated by In other words, what I'm saying is uh, to say, you know, like a free group, right? If you want to map out of a free group, you just have to say where to send the generators. So free objects are things that where it's easy to map out of those. Um, and so that's what we're saying here. It, uh, a map out of the Coborism category is just the same as, a, as a specifying where the, where the disk goes. Okay, so I need to explain briefly what the fully divisible objects are and to give some examples. So if you've ever seen the notion of a um, uh, of evaluation and co-evaluation for vector spaces, then you've seen the notion of, of dualizability of objects. So so to say that X is dualizable, so X is going to be an object in S, not fully dualizable, but just dualizable, is is a very familiar notion. So given X. There are supposed to exist other objects called uh, x star and x star. If that's a symmetric monoidal, that you can identify them. But, uh, but anyways, two, two objects, just picking one of them, uh, these objects come with uh, an evaluation map from x dual tensor x dual to the unit of S. So you should think vector space, the dual vector space, and the map. What makes the problem interesting is that you also want a co-evaluation. And then you want to be able to draw this diagram that looks like this. So if I draw the evaluation, so it's a map from x dual tensor x to the unit. If I draw it in this sort of TFT way, I, I put minus here, plus here, and I think of that as a map from x dual tensor x to the unit. So this is called the graphical calculus uh, for, for working like this. The co-evaluation is another one, which crucially goes in the opposite order. Okay. And then, so the evaluation and co-evaluation, these are supposed to satisfy an identity, which is called the Zorro axiom, um, which says that if I draw this diagram, this is equal to going straight up and down, um, which is equal to uh, this diagram. And by this diagram here, what I mean is, uh, for instance, or let me do the other one. What I mean is that we, uh, okay, so we do the co-evaluation uh, tensor the identity. That's this bit here. See, because you've done the co-evaluation to create those two and you've done nothing here. And then you compose with the identity tensor the evaluation, and you want this to just be the identity on X. Okay, uh, 
let me just uh, say the, the, uh, the other definition, and, and happily there's only one other definition I need to give. So the prototype here, obviously, was the prototype was that's the category of vector spaces. Here, the prototype is the two category of categories. Uh, so if I have not an object but a morphism somewhere, so I have say f from some x to some y. In the two category, I can talk about it having right adjoints and left adjoints. Uh, and you should think about adjoints of functors. Maybe, hopefully, maybe you've seen adjoints of functors before. And you know that one way to express adjoints of functors is that they should have, oh dear, now I need to make sure this is right. Um, so there's a co-unit which maps uh, So there's a, there's a co-unit which is like an evaluation. There's a unit which is like uh, a co-evaluation. There's a similar thing for the left adjoint. And uh, these will also satisfy a sort of uh, Zorro type axiom. Um, if you draw, so FR is supposed to be a, a riser joint here? Yeah, did I get it backwards? Yeah, it's the other way around. Get it backwards, sorry, yes. Uh, I think I was worried about this. Yeah, confusingly, the right adjoints and the right duals in tensor categories are backwards. So, yes. um, so and now there's a similar calculus for these uh, for these diagrams where we think of this F here uh, as um, if we draw a morphism F in a two category, we can put say its source and its target on either side. And then, uh, the, of course, these, the axioms that the unit and the co-unit of a, a junction satisfy <coughs> is that um, we have these, these identities. So what it's doing is it's saying that you can sort of now start partitioning the, the space up into two, uh, uh, two regions um, uh, along F. And you see what we're trying to get at is that you can move this thing topologically. So that's supposed to start to look like the topological defects picture. Um, and uh, let me just uh, you know, just say the last definition, which is that um, um, x and s is fully dualizable if it lies in a fully dualizable subcategory. And a sub uh, subcategory S prime of S is fully dualizable if every object and every K morphism. So if every object has duals and every k-morphism has adjoints. <coughs> okay. So that is the definition that we can then use to apply, uh, apply to, and test to the Coborza hypothesis. And the, the, the point I want to stress about this definition is that I spent all this time talking about higher categories and infinity stuff, um, but the beautiful thing about the Coborn hypothesis is that I, I, I only gave you a definition involving two categories, and the definition of being a fully dualizable object is only about the two categories that you meet along the way. 
So you need, you, need the, you need the n category to be well-defined. You need to have a well-defined n category um, in order to even be able to probe this theorem. But if you're an algebraist like myself, you're comfortable working with two categories and not so comfortable working with infinity n categories. And the, the sorts of things that we're going to do, it's going to turn out to just be uh, basically category theory uh, and linear algebra. So uh, apologies for going over time. I have an extremely basic question because I'm a physicist. So at the very beginning of the previous lecture, I think, you drew the objects and morphisms in the category of cobordisms. You drew the you drew the cylinder and you said the objects are like the top, the tops and, and the morphism the middle point. But uh, you can also uh, draw like a square and then divide it in half and then call each of the halves the object and the line in the middle, the morphism, if that makes sense. And then you are switching the, what? which is the bigger dimension uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, from what I remember that in physics, I often see the second one. And then does this make a, this, is this difference relevant in? No, it's a great question. Um, uh, so you mean you, 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 you're saying that you are more comfortable in fact with this picture? Where you have the, where where a morphism yeah. is between x and y. Yeah, I'll actually stick to that uh, notation. Um, in fact, we'll, we'll be that'll be sort of forced on us mathematically. I mean, you can do, you can. There's a sort of duality. You can take this picture and draw it in a different way. Um, it's just like a historical thing when people first invented categories. They thought about the <coughs> objects as points and and so on. Um, but this picture is also more useful for for math, for mathematics as well. For instance. If I wrote out these axioms the way that one usually does, it would not be clear why it's simply this topological picture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are the morphisms in these categories in your statement of the Cobordism hypothesis? What are the morphisms here? On either side. Oh, for this to be an equivalent? Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, right. So. Uh, Yes, very good. So, okay, good. So the question is, all right, the first order statement that I said is, I said there's an equivalence, and in parentheses I put n minus one categories, yeah. Um, in fact, I should probably, I should, I should, I should really say infinity one categories. I mean, an n minus one category is, is such a thing, but, um, but, but Will's asking a good question. Um, to first approximation, what this is saying is that a TFT is determined by a uh, uh, fully dualizable object. Um, but we're going to be using a lot that this is stronger. Because if I have, uh, if I want, if I have, if I have two, for instance, if I have two dualizable objects and an isomorphism between them, that's going to induce an isomorphism between the, the top of the field theories that they, that they induce. And in particular, I'm, I'm glad this came up. So in, in this, uh, Collaboration, what we're often interested in is the, the higher structures of, of like the theory of defects. So in the topological case, as a consequence of this, if I just look at the automorphisms of the dualizable object X that, that's attached to this theory, um, that's going to be some higher group. And that higher group, like by definition, is the defect theory for the topological theory. And in particular, if I have a topological, fully extended topological, I think this is why Michaela encouraged me to give these, these lectures. If I, if I have a fully topological field theory, I have my D manifold with some QFT, and I have my fully topological theory sitting in the bulk of dimension D plus one, um, as soon as I've told you that this topological TFT couples to this one, and as soon as I've told you that this TFT is fully extended, and then as soon as I've told you the object X, then all of the defects that you can possibly put in this quantum field theory via this thing are just the same as just taking that object and just computing its, its endomorphisms. 
Does that clarify your question? Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I guess I was a little confused if you had taken um, like the groupoid on the on the right hand side or or uh, this right hand side. Yeah, it's the space of fully dualizable objects, the infinity groupoid. Yeah. That means you have an equivalence not of infinity of one categories, but just of spaces? Like you do... Oh, yeah. Um, the left hand side, space. That's what the thing yeah, says. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it's just it says equivalence of... Uh, and then equivalence of spaces. Equivalence of spaces. Yeah, yeah. Equivalence of spaces. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's actually the same, right? Because any morphism between fully dualizable objects or... Yeah, exactly. It's invertible. Even if I don't... Yeah, so we'll come back to this in the future lectures. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, what I meant to say, what, indeed, what I meant to say is an equivalence of infinity groupoids, so infinity zero categories, if you like, just equivalence of spaces. Um, but in fact, uh, and here I wrote odd x, but there's, a, there's, a version, there's an upgrade of this Coborzo hypothesis for uh, TFTs with defects, and here I can put end x. And then as long as by, uh, then as long as I mean not just um, invertible higher morphisms, but suitably dualizable morphisms, then I can talk about non-invertible defects in the theory and, and relate them to non-invertible defects here. But, um, yeah. So, uh, what sense this is a uh, typological theory? In what sense is this a topological theory rather than a, why do we use the word topological? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, it's just because, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it's just because um, this category of cobordisms is, by definition, it only cares about the topology of the, of the underlying manifold. So in contrast to a physical theory where, um, you know, the, 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 the vector spaces and the numbers and everything that you're defining in a very manifest way depend on things like a Riemannian metric or other, other geometric structures. Um, the topological field theory, it, it, the, this notion of cobordism, there was no metric on the spaces. Yeah, but by manifold, you mean a topological space? Topological manifold, yeah. And we also only care about them up to diffeomorphism, so that also makes it. Yeah, and yes, that's also true. Yes. Yeah. So every so basically, this whole this whole thing is is um, uh, all it's replete with structures that only care about the topology of the manifold, diffeomorphisms, isotopies, things like that. They don't care about, you know, I don't have to ask whether a map. Uh, intertwines a Riemannian metric because there is no metric. Yeah. They could care about the smooth structure, right, or not? Yeah, I've been sort of avoiding that question about <laughs> smooth structures. Um, I'd, I'd prefer to continue avoiding it. So, <laughs> All the examples that I'll work with are either, so it only matters in dimension four. Everything I'll discuss is, um, to the extent that we discuss anything in dimension four, it will be, um, Topological in the category and in the topological manifold sense, it won't involve uh, different morphisms. Okay. Maybe let's postpone further questions for the discussion session uh, in about half an hour, so quarter past five. And there's coffee and cake. Down. But before we leave, let's thank David again.